Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jill Hankin with the Virginia Poverty Law Center. And I really appreciate all of you uh, tuning in today to be part of this webinar. We're going to spend about an hour talking about the uh, new health insurance marketplace for Virginia. Uh, today we'll be talking about the basics. Um, after my presentation, um, we'll have time to take questions, um, which you can um, send to us uh, via the online question tool. Um, we will answer your questions at the end of the session, and you can ask those questions as we move along. So please don't hesitate to uh, use that tool to get us questions that you have. Um, I always like to um, start a presentation like this by reviewing for the audience what the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, is really all about. Um, there are three major buckets of goals in the, in the law. First of all, is to extend affordable insurance to more Americans. We have 50 million uninsured people in the United States, and the law intends to provide options for insurance coverage to many, many millions of those people. The second bucket is all about improving private health insurance and reforming some of the abuses that have been common in private health insurance over the years, like denying people coverage for pre-existing conditions, or placing caps on coverage, or annual limits, or rescinding a policy for an innocent mistake on an application. So that's the second bucket. And the third bucket is all about developing better health delivery systems so that providers are paid more for the value of the services provided than the volume, looking more at quality than quantity. And there are lots of uh, projects, innovations, um, experiments underway right now as a result of the Affordable Care Act to improve and modernize our health delivery system. Uh, bringing the law a little closer to home, in Virginia we know that we have up to one million uninsured people. And most of the uninsured in Virginia are uh, individuals and families that are lower income. They have income below 200% of the poverty line, and most of them are from families where there are workers. So we're getting close now to the time when there will be major changes, um, starting on January 1st. Uh, those changes include an option for uh, an expansion of the Medicaid program for more adults. Um, in Virginia, there's a possibility of new coverage for up to 400,000 uninsured Virginians if the state would adopt the Medicaid expansion. Um, the state is not there yet. Uh, there's a legislative commission looking at Medicaid reforms, which the General Assembly decided needed to be completed um, before expanding coverage. So we're still waiting for that. The second major change, of course, is the new insurance marketplace, which we're going to be talking about today. And this is where people can shop for and purchase affordable private coverage. And the third big new requirement is the mandate requiring individuals and businesses to uh, have or provide health insurance. Um, so again, we'll be uh, mostly talking about the marketplace today, and I'm going to say a little bit about the mandate before we're done. So talking about our new insurance marketplace, uh, states did have the option to create their own exchanges or marketplaces, but Virginia chose not to. So as a result, Virginia will be served by a federally facilitated marketplace that will be run by the federal government, and we use the acronym FSM. And this is where individuals uh, can compare and purchase private health insurance. What they buy are called qualified health plans, or QUIPs. And the important thing to realize about the ex exchange or marketplace is that that's the only place people can get premium tax credits to help them pay for their insurance premiums. 
Only if you go to the FFM can you get tax credit. Um, the marketplace is also going to be available to small employers, and those are businesses that have fewer than 50 full-time equivalent employees. And that part of the marketplace is called the SHOP, which stands for Small Business Health Options Program. Um, small employers can go to the SHOP and purchase insurance for their employees. For a limited time, um, there are tax credits available to those small businesses. And the idea here is for all small businesses to participate in the same risk pool, the same insurance risk pool, to help keep the cost of insurance coverage down. So instead of trying to buy insurance for a very small business with like five employees, you'll be part of a, a pool with many thousand um, employees of small businesses. And um, at the top of the slide, I, I give you all the um, citation to the Code of Federal Regulations where all the federal regulations about the marketplace can be found. And the reason we wanted to do this webinar and start our webinar series um, is uh, because open enrollment is right around the corner, fewer than 50 days away. Starting on October 1st, people can apply for uh, coverage through the marketplace. Open enrollment will go for six months until the end of March 2014. Um, however, the coverage won't begin until January 1. Um, but a point to remember, we're all excited about open enrollment, but there will be opportunities even after March 31st for people to uh, shop for and enroll in insurance if they meet conditions for a special enrollment period. Um, and this would be available to people uh, who, for example, may have lost their health insurance coverage because uh, they um, changed their jobs, um, for people who um, got married or adopted a child or the birth of a new child. Uh, those folks can get a special enrollment period. Also, folks who change their immigration status may be actually newly eligible for um, coverage, and they can uh, apply at any time in the year with um, the special enrollment period. Uh, and interesting to see that a special enrollment period is also available if the uh, marketplace makes an error in someone's case or for other exceptional circumstances. So those are sort of catch-all situations that might apply to individual circumstances. It's also important to understand that um, the open enrollment period is for uh, the marketplace, but applications for Medicaid and FAMIS are open and accepted throughout the entire year. So um, after March 31st, we're going to still see plenty of uh, uh, activity and there's plenty of work to do in terms of helping folks with special enrollment um, and applications for people we know or we think are going to be eligible for Medicaid or famous. Now there are two basic conditions to be eligible for insurance through the marketplace if you want to get those premium tax credits, which help you pay for the premiums. First of all, the uh, individual or family's income has to be between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty line. And here's a chart showing you the range of that income. The second condition is that the individual or family does not have access to affordable job-based coverage. Um, and in, there's a specific calculation that will be used to determine if the job-based coverage is affordable or not. And they're going to look only at the cost of an employee-only plan to determine if the cost exceeds 9.5% of family income. Um, and you may be thinking that, well, that doesn't really seem fair to look only at the employee's cost for coverage, what if there's a family and the cost of family coverage is a lot higher? Well, it, it really doesn't, it really isn't fair, but unfortunately that is the law and the way it's been interpreted at the federal level. So in looking at that cost of job-based coverage, they will only be looking at the cost 
of employee only coverage. Um, and the second piece of this is, is to determine whether or not the insurance itself provides um, an actuarial value, and we'll be talking about that a lot later, um, of about of, of no less than 60%. Um, basically, does the plan, is it good enough to cover about 60% of the indiv an average individual's um, health care needs um, over the course of a year? Um, so those are the two requirements um, in terms of eligibility to, to get those tax credits through the marketplace. I should also mention here that if someone's already enrolled in Medicaid or Medicare, um, they're not going to qualify uh, for exchange products either because they have minimum essential coverage. In terms of applying through the marketplace, there will be many options available to people, multiple doors for application. The, the main one, though, is the online application process that you can see at the federal website, healthcare.gov. And this really is a great website. It's easy to navigate. It uses um, easy to understand language. And this is where people can actually file for their health insurance after October 1st of 2013. There's also a and I should say that you can go to that website today for a lot of excellent information about the marketplaces and about the Affordable Care Act. Um, it, it's quite good. I recommend it. Um, also, live today is the federal call center at the number that's listed. And this is a 24-7 phone line that's staffed by people who can help um, people who speak many languages and can provide uh, basic information about the marketplace. Uh, we also expect to see a Virginia call center. We're not sure exactly what the Virginia call center is going to do. Um, we know that it will be helping people with Medicaid and FAMIS applications. Um, we believe that folks who don't qualify for those programs but could possibly get coverage through the exchange. We believe they'll be referred. Uh, we don't know if they'll be referred um, automatically to the federal phone number or automatically um, to some other place, but, or if they're going to have to actually hang up and dial again. That, that's a detail that we're still waiting to figure out. People can also apply for our coverage uh, through our local departments of social services. Um, either in person or online. DSS now has an online application system called Common Help, and there's the website for that, um, where people can go today and apply for um, Medicaid and other public benefits. And after October 1st, the application will also include applications for um, exchange or marketplace products with the tax credit. And I also included the link to uh, the new federal paper application, um, just so you could see how the federal government is going to be asking people to, um, to file for coverage. Um, there's this particular link is to the family application, and it's, I think it's about 12 pages because there are a lot of pages for different family members. But there will be a shorter paper application for um, individuals, and there's also an even shorter application for people who want, who want to get health insurance through the marketplace but are not interested in tax credits. Um, you should know, however, that the online application is going to be um, even more streamlined because it will only ask people questions that are relevant to them. So for example, if an individual is applying for coverage on the online application, they won't have to sift through questions about other family members because it's only for one person. So um, the federal government is encouraging people to use the federal online portal 
to file these applications because it will be the most streamlined way to, to get that application completed. And here's some of the information that people will need. Uh, we talked earlier about that requirement that people don't have access to affordable employer-based coverage. So if someone's in that circumstance, there's gonna, there will be questions about whether or not um, there is access to employer-based coverage and uh, what it costs the employee and what the, the range of um, coverage is. And this is an area where people will have to be asking their employers to, to fill out a, a little form that explains exactly what's being offered by the employer. And we expect that after October 1, uh, the employers that are offering health insurance to their employees will very quickly become familiar with this form and, and help people fill it out so that they can get through this part of the application. Beyond that, it's pretty straightforward in terms of the identity information for all the applicants, including their social security number and immigration status. Uh, for household size and countable income, uh, this is a, a new concept for us in the healthcare world, but the new rules are all going to follow tax code principles. And people will be asked what they expect their household size to be in 2014, what they expect their income to be in 2014. Because remember, we're talking about health insurance coverage during 2014, and then the, the next April, April 15th of 2015, people will be filing their tax return by that date. And that's where the questions are going to be asked about, did you have insurance? Uh, for how long, et cetera. And the amount of the tax credits that people get are going to be based on the actual 2014 tax returns that are filed in 2015. Now, part of the benefit of applying online and with federal applications now is that there's going to be access to databases that are going to verify a lot of the information that the applicants provide so that instead of always asking for verifi verification of income and verification of um, you know, your employment, um, the databases are supposed to help with that. Um, they're supposed to help with the social security numbers and the immigration status, and even looking at um, income that's being uh, received currently or reports of income being received currently through different databases. And this is intended to streamline the process so that paper documents are only asked for as a last resort. Now, when you get to the marketplace, you'll see that there's a lot of standardization. Uh, this, again, is intended to uh, standardize and streamline things for the applicant. And one of the first things that's standardized are the essential health benefits, or EHBs. All the plans have to include those, those following 10 items. Um, and I point out a few interesting items, such as the mental health and substance abuse services, um, pediatric services, um, including oral and vision care for kids, um, and maternity care. These are some of the things that we very often never saw private health insurance, but now the CLIPS are going to have to include all of these services. Um, now, every plan won't be identical in terms of, you know, how many visits you get and the actual scope of each of these things and whether or not certain services need to be pre-authorized or not, but they all have to include these services. If there are any substitutions, they have to um, be substantially uh, equal to a Virginia benchmark plan, which is Anthem's um, small group plan, is the, the benchmark that we're using in Virginia. Um, and um, so there will be consistency in the uh, services that people get in any of these quips. Another way that things will be standardized is that the quips are going to be grouped by value. 
this is where we talk about actuarial, actuarial value of each plan. And, and the actuarial value really is um, a standard that represents how comprehensive is the coverage, how much is being covered by the plan, how much is being paid by the uh, enrollee. And the higher the actuarial value, the more comprehensive the coverage, um, but the premiums are going to be higher. Um, Out-of-pockets may be lower as you go to the doctor and get specific services, but the premiums are definitely going to be higher for the um, higher actuarial value plan. So in the marketplace, all the plans are going to be grouped into these four tiers of metal tiers, uh, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And you can see the relative um, actuarial values of each. Um, and definitely, you will see lower premiums at the bronze end and higher premiums at the uh, platinum end. Um, but those groups, those groupings will help people compare and shop for what suits their family's needs the best and suits their pocketbook the best. In addition, there will be catastrophic coverage for people who are under age 30. And these plans will be somewhat different because they have very high deductibles. They, they still have to cover all those essential health benefits, but they will have very high deductibles. So the premium cost for such plans should be uh, significantly lower than any other choices. Um, but again, that's only for people under age 30. And here's just a picture of the various metal tiers and the comparison of the, uh, well, the stated actuarial value. But it shows that you know, the platinum plan itself would generally cover about 90% of the um, individual's health care needs. Um, but the person is going to pay for about 10% of those expenses. Another important change in the Affordable Care Act is what the law requires to ensure reasonable premiums. Um, first of all, um, there's, there's a whole new uh, set of rules about setting premiums on um, different criteria. It used to be the plans could um, charge more uh, to folks who had pre-existing conditions. Often those, those costs were out of sight. And also, historically, women paid more for their health insurance than men. Those situations have, have totally been prohibited, um, although the plans can now um, base their premiums on the age of the applicant, on the geographic area where they live. And they can also charge a lot more, I think about a third more, if the person's a smoker. So um, the, the whole way that plans have to set their rates, their premium rates, has changed. Um, also, there are provisions now in the law to require uh, rate reviews by the state and or federal government whenever a premium is planned to increase by more than 10%. I mean, that's pretty, that's brand new in Virginia. We had very little rate review at all in this state. So this is a welcome change. But I think most importantly, there's a new medical loss ratio that applies to all these plans that requires that the plans actually pay out 80 to 85 cents for every premium dollar on actual medical benefits. And if plans can't meet that MLR, then they have to rebate money to the customers for what they overcharged the customers. And we know last year, in August, there was $43 million returned to 685,000 Virginians because the plan simply charged them too much. They, the, the plans um, did not pay 80 to 85% uh, on medical benefits directly. So this, again, will be a very important part of uh, controlling um, premium costs. 
for consumers. So where are we now in Virginia? Um, well, the Bureau of Insurance within the State Corporation Commission was given the authority to review and, and approve insurance rates for certain plans and to perform all the plan management functions for the marketplace. So that means that the Bureau is responsible for certifying that a particular plan is eligible for sale on the marketplace. And after a lengthy process, um, just last month, I believe, the Bureau did recommend nine different uh, insurance companies for certification for Virginia's uh, marketplace. Uh, four of the plans are statewide. Uh, four of them are planning to cover only the Fairfax region, and one is planning to be only in the uh, Rich, uh, I'm sorry, Lynchburg area. Um, and those nine companies are going to be offering a total of about 200 different plans. And the way you get to that large number is to realize that each of these plans will be um, offering plans in different metal tiers. They'll be offering plans in different geographic areas. They will have the different age ratings. They will have the different costs for smokers. Um, and we'll look in a little while. They'll have different plans for people who are eligible for cost sharing reduction. Um, so when you start multiplying out the, the various iterations of plans, you can see that it doesn't take much before nine companies are offering 200 different plans. But when people are shopping on the exchange, shopping in the marketplace, um, they will only be, be seeing the plans that fit their particular needs. So, for example, if you're not in Lynchburg, you're not going to see the plan from the Piedmont Insurance Company. Um, so people are not going to have to wade through 200 different plans on the uh, internet. They'll be able to see which of the plans are available to them and, and fit their particular needs and the rates that apply to their situation. So here's another chart showing these nine companies that are planning to do business in um, in Virginia. I should point out that Healthkeepers, Inc. is actually an Anthem HMO product. Um, if you were wondering where Anthem was, Anthem is the Healthkeepers HMO. And the nine companies all plan to offer individual policies. And um, six of them will also be offering shop plans for small businesses. Now what kind of rates are we going to see? Um, well, last month in, in, in July, the State Corporation Commission held a, a meeting and had a hearing where these nine plans that want to provide uh, quips on Virginia's um, marketplace uh, made uh, presentations describing what their rates would be for what they would consider their most popular plan. Now, I, I warn you in advance that these numbers, there's, there's not a lot of certainty to this at the moment in terms of comparisons because we really don't know if these are reflecting the same metal tier of plan. Um, they don't seem to show different geographic variables or those tobacco ratings. But just to give you a basic idea of what the premium rates, and these are monthly premium rates, what they might be for these three different categories, um, here, here are the numbers that were presented to the SCC. So there are numbers for the single male who's age 29 relatively inexpensive coverage uh, for a family of four where their parents are 45 and they have two children. And then the cost for an older couple who are both age 60. So again, this is just for your interest. Um, don't rely on these numbers right now. Um, but it, it's interesting to see even so, that there really is sort of a wide range of, of prices. And again, these are for the monthly premiums only. And this is what the health insurance plans are going to charge. It's not necessarily what the individuals pay. 
because, as we'll be talking about in a minute, um, many individuals will be eligible for premium tax credits that are going to reduce the cost of their premium. So these uh, certifications that were, were um, made by the Bureau of Insurance were shipped up to the federal government, and now things are pending at uh, CMS to make the final decision on which plans are going to be certified for sale on Virginia's federally facilitated marketplace. And we will be able to see the actual rates being charged on October 1st, because that's open enrollment and everything's got to be up and running. And of course, we hope to be able to see some of this beforehand, so we'll be able to give good advice to um, individuals that we're working with. So let's talk some more about the uh, premium tax credits. Now again, the only way to get premium tax credits are, is to shop at the FFM. Okay, you can't get it any other way. And, and just consider these tax credits as a form of financial assistance to help people pay for their health insurance. Um, and the tax credits themselves are based on the family's income and the cost of the second lowest cost silver plan. So even you know, within the metal tier, even within the silver metal tier, they're going to be different prices, as we just saw a minute ago. So the tax credits themselves are going to identify, well, what would the premium rates be for the second lowest silver plan for this individual or this family? And that's how we calculate the tax credit. And based on the individual's or the family's income, there will be a maximum contribution that they should make towards the premium. And again, this is calculated from their income. And you'll see here the chart that if the countable income is under 133% of the poverty line, that they will be expected to pay just 2% of their income for their health insurance premium. At the other end of the scale, 400% uh, of poverty, the cost is 9.5% of family income. Um, and we're going to work a very simple example here. So you see how this tax credit is going to work. Um, and I should point out that our next webinar in two weeks we're going to spend a lot more time talking about premium tax credits and talking some more about how do you figure out what the household size is, how do you figure out family income, just so you get a better handle on that. But for now, a very straightforward example about the tax credits is this. Let's just talk about John, who is a 32-year-old single male. He has an annual income of $17,200. And that is 150% of the poverty line. So we look back at our chart, and we see that at 150% of the poverty line, he's expected to pay 4% of his income towards the cost of his health insurance. 4% of his income is $688 a year. The next step is to figure out, well, what's the cost of the second lowest silver plan? And just looking at those charges, those rates that were provided to the State Corporation Commission, I just sort of selected this number to relate loosely to that. So let's say his, the cost of the, the second lowest silver plan is $4,000 a year. Um, well, from that amount, John's required to pay $688. So that means that John's annual federal tax credit is $3,312. So if you divide those numbers by 12, um, you'll see that every month John will pay $57.33, while the, oh, this is where I have a typo, it's $276 a month goes, uh, uh, is paid in tax credits. Sorry about the typo. Um, $276 is the tax credit that's paid directly 
to the health insurance plan. So you add the 276 and the 5733 together, and that's where you get the $333 a month is the cost of this um, second lowest silver plan. Now, that's the beginning part of this process. Um, I, I should point out that John is deciding to, he can decide to use his tax credit for other tier plans if he wants to. So he could take, he could take his tax credit of $3,312 and instead of getting a silver plan, he could buy a um, gold plan. But then he'd have to pay more out of pocket towards those premiums. Um, he could choose to get a bronze plan, in which case the premiums would be less, and maybe the 300, I'm sorry, the 3,312 tax credit would be enough to pay for the entire bronze uh, premium, so he wouldn't have to pay anything. So there is some flexibility once you figure out what the tax credit is. Um, which plan you want to buy. Um, and the tax credit is fully refundable with your tax return, even if you don't uh, pay, have to pay any taxes or even if you don't owe any taxes, you can get this whole amount back in a lump sum at the end of the year. Or, as I described in this example, John is choosing to get advanced payments of the federal tax credits every month so that his cost uh, is just the $57.33 a month. Um, lower income people are obviously going to need to take their credits in advance in order to help them pay for their monthly premiums. But when you take your tax credits in advance, it's very important that people understand that they need to report any changes in their circumstances, like if their household size goes up or down, or if their income goes up or down, they need to make those adjustments during the year so that the tax credits can be adjusted. Because at the end of the year, again, talking about the year 2014, and you're going to be filing your tax returns by April of 2015. In your tax returns, that's where there's a reconciliation process to figure out if the tax credits that somebody received throughout the year um, were actually the right amount. So it, it is important when people choose their advanced tax credits, which a lot of people are going to need to do, that they be advised about making reports of their changes so they don't get surprised at tax time and figure out that they got too much in tax credits and that they owe money back to the federal government. Um, and if you want to fool around with some other family sizes or family incomes, there's a really good um, calculator at the Kaiser website uh, where you can um, plug in some other numbers and, and see uh, what kind of tax credits people might be eligible for. Now, besides premiums to purchase your insurance, there are going to be out-of-pocket costs, as there are for all private insurance right now. There are deductibles, there are co-payments, et cetera. Um, but the Affordable Care Act does contain a very important special protection for low-income people. Uh, so for people whose income is less than 250% of the poverty line, there are these special cost-sharing protections if they buy a silver plan. And so this is, again, something important to understand and share with people that you're working with, that you only get the special cost sharing protections if you buy a silver plan. Um, and the way it works is that the cost sharing protections actually increase the actuarial value of the silver plan, which if you recall was a 70% actuarial value in our previous chart. But if you're really low income, like 100 to 150% of the poverty line, the actuarial value of that silver plan will go up to 94%, which is really like a platinum plan. And that basically means that the cost 
cost sharing, the out-of-pocket costs of that policy are going to be much lower than they ordinarily would be for people with higher income. And then, again, it's, there's a graduated um, protection depending on your income. So if you're at 150 to 200 percent of poverty, the value of that civil plan goes from 70 to 87 percent actuarial value. Um, if you're over 200 but under 250 percent, the actuarial value just sort of clicks up a little bit to 73 percent of actuarial value. But this is really important to appreciate. This is one of the most important benefits um, in the Affordable Care Act because we know for low-income families that some of them are going to be stretching to pay their premiums, even with the tax credits. They still have to find the cash every month to pay $57 or whatever it's going to be. Um, but on the cost-sharing end, when they go see doctors, it's very important that the cost-sharing stay limited. And that's an, a protection that's in place. There are also other limits on out-of-pocket costs for everybody, even those folks who aren't low income. Um, and, and these are, are tied to um, the current federal uh, limits for health savings accounts. And the, this limits total cost sharing for essential health benefits only. Okay? So if, if someone's getting a service that isn't on that list of 10 essential health benefits, then there may well be other benefits offered. So for just an easy example that pops into mind is like, what if a plan has an adult dental benefit? Okay, that's not an essential health benefit. So any cost sharing that's required for the adult to get dental benefit won't count towards this upper limit of out-of-pocket cost. And here's the chart that shows um, the maximum out-of-pocket cost for an individual and a family at different um, poverty line level. And, and you may be wondering, well, how in the world can someone with 100 to 200 percent of poverty ever, how could a family at that low income level ever manage to pay $4,000? Well, they probably won't get there if they're smart enough to buy the silver plan. <laughs> because with the silver plan, they will get the cost sharing reduction, which means the value of their plan is actually 94% actuarial value. So out-of-pocket costs are going to be very low. And it would take a whole lot of medical services for them to get anywhere close to hitting this cap of $4,000. But I, I hope one of the takeaways today for you is, is this idea that the cost sharing protections attach only to the silver plan. And that's going to be a really important um, part of counseling lower income families. I just want to say a word about those dental benefits. Um, as I said earlier, the um, list of essential health benefits does include a pediatric dental benefit. Um, they have to be offered either in the QIP itself or as a standalone dental plan. Um, and people will have choices if they're shopping in the marketplace. They'll have choices about whether or not they actually buy the pediatric dental plan. And obviously, if, if it's someone without kids, they're probably going to choose not to buy it. Um, but um, in terms of paying for um, a standalone dental plan, um, there needs to be consideration of how families might be able to use their premium tax credits to help them pay for those standalone dental plans. They may not want all of their tax credits to go to a QIP that doesn't have the dental benefit because they may not have any tax credits left to help them pay for a standalone pediatric dental plan. This is a fairly confusing issue um, in the law, and families are going to need good advice about how to um, maximize their, their coverage. I mean, I think basically there will be um, quips that offer the pediatric dental benefit within that plan for which your tax credits are just going to be applied as they ordinarily will be applied. That might be the best bet for, for, for most families, but we're going to have to see the details of what the plans look like and what the actual coverage looks like. Um, 
the Bureau of Insurance also did look at um, the pediatric dental plans and they approved 13 standalone plans. So I, I hope you can see from our discussion so far that um, while there are a lot, there's new standardization and there's streamlined applications, um, there still are aspects of this that are fairly uh, complicated and people are going to need assistance as they go online and start applications and start hearing about premium tax credits. Um, trying to figure out if they want the tax credits in advance or if they'll wait till the end of the tax year. And there's actually an option to take um, a, a partial tax credit in advance. Um, so there, there are going to be tr uh, decisions that people have to make. And then even looking at all the various um, health plans available, just um, comparing and shopping and trying to figure out what's best for the family um, there's a role for good information and application assistance. So um, there will be opportunities for outreach and enrollment assistance to the folks who are um, trying to get affordable health insurance. Um, Virginia's Navigator uh, uh, grant awards were just announced um, today. Um, and I'm happy to say the Poverty Law Center did get a Navigator grant. We're real excited about that opportunity, um, along with a, another Virginia organization um, that does patient advocacy within hospitals. Um, but in addition to the Navigator grant, um, there's money flowing to 22 of Virginia's community health centers. Um, and, and the staff there will be what's called certified application counselors. But other nonprofits and other health uh, interests and doctor's offices can also become certified application counselors um, where the federal government will actually certify you. You have to take some training and get tested and you'll be certified and your um, services will be publicized so that you can also help folks. And, and then application assisters is just the label that we're calling a whole host of other groups and individuals who want to play a role in this and um, help people with their applications. They don't need to take tests or get certified, but they'll be assisters. And it's important to remember also that agents and brokers have an important role to play. I think they'll do a lot of work with small businesses, but they'll also help individuals um, with their applications. And if you're interested in outreach and enrollment, uh, you could look at the regs and guidance at the um, website that's noted there. So before we close, um, I want to just say briefly um, a little bit about those minimum coverage requirements um, that require individuals and um, businesses, large businesses, to, to offer insurance, well, individuals to get insurance and large businesses to offer insurance to their employees. Um, and, and the whole point behind this, and, and this was the main issue that was challenged in um, the litigation challenging the Affordable Care Act, um, but the whole point here is to spread the risk of insurance over a larger pool of people. And it's really important that we have younger and healthier people in um, insurance at the same time that older and sicker people are in the pool. Um, if we allow people to just buy insurance when they're on the way to the hospital, um, it just doesn't help to pay for the cost. So everyone needs to be in the pool to try to keep those costs as low as possible. Um, as far as the individual mandate goes, there are many excep exceptions uh, to that mandate, and I list them there. Um, a lot of the exceptions have to do with the cost of insurance. So if the family finds out the cost is, is simply too high, um, they don't have to have insurance. Um, if the family's income is, uh, is low enough that they aren't even required to file for taxes or file a tax return, they're not required to have insurance. They can have it if they want, but they're not going to be penalized if they don't. Um, then you see the other um, exceptions for religious objectors, Native Americans, undocumented immigrants do not qualify for, for any of these new affordability products, although um, 
they could still get emergency services through the Medicaid program if they would otherwise qualify for current Medicaid, uh, people in jail, and people who are uninsured for less than three months. So again, when we see how this is all going to work, um, for the year 2014, we're going to file our tax returns before April 15th of 2015. And in our new tax returns, we're going to be explaining whether or not we had insurance, for how long we had insurance, whether or not we had we received any tax credits and how much those tax credits were, and that's going to help uh, calculate our you know our ultimate bottom line of how much in taxes we owe or how much in tax refunds we are going to get. And again, the tax credits are fully refundable. So even if you don't owe any taxes, you could get the whole amount of those tax credits if you choose to get it in a lump sum at the end of the year. Um, there is also a mandate that applies to um, large employers, uh, and those large employers um, are those companies that have over 50 full-time equivalent employees. Uh, the penalties, uh, the reporting and penalties for this piece of the Affordable Care Act have been delayed until 2015, um, just to let the other parts of the law get in place first. Now, if you are subject to the mandate but you fail to have insurance, um, there are penalties. But overall, the penalties are, are really a lot less than the cost of insurance. So I look at this more of an incentive to have uh, insurance rather than a punishment for not having insurance. And um, I've put up here uh, for each of the next few years you know, what the penalties can be. And for the first year, um, an adult, a single adult, the, um, the penalty is $95 or 1% of family income that is um, above the filing threshold. So you may remember that the filing threshold I pointed out somewhere in here was $10,000 for an individual. So it would be one per, either $95 or 1% of the income above $10,000. Um, and then there are other you know, you add in, if it's a family, you add in penalties for the child, and there's the maximums. And um, uh, another thing I learned recently is that the, the maximum penalty can't be more than the cost of the average bronze policy nationwide. Um, so again, the penalties are, are not as much punishment as they are incentives for people to go ahead and get insurance and take care of the uh, new affordable options that we have. So before I close, I do want to remind you um, of our, our next two webinars that sort of build on what we started today. And the next webinar is going to be um, on the 29th of August. And we'll get into more of the nitty gritty about the premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions, um, talking about you know, household composition and income. Because as you can see, that federal poverty line rating or, or, or status is really going to dictate a lot of what's going on for a family. You know, where they fall in the poverty line calculation really is going to make a difference. And that's totally dependent on how many people are in the family and what their countable income is for that purpose. So um, we'll be digging into some of those details. And then the third webinar will be the, uh, September 13th, and we'll talk about some of the Medicaid eligibility changes and the Medicaid expansion that's still pending um, in Virginia. So with that, um, I'll, I say thank you for participating. And, and now we'll turn to some of the questions that have come in uh, while we've been uh, going through the slides. Um, a question is about um, the, the, the tax uh, credits. Um, are, are, the, are the premiums due each month, and, and then they get, then you could get reimbursed at tax time? Well, yeah, the health plans get paid on a monthly basis. The premiums are payable each month. And as I said, the tax credits, you can choose to get them um, 
in advance every month, or you can wait and get your tax credit in a lump sum at the end of the year, or you can take a partial credit. So you have a lot of choices about how you apply your tax credit. Um, are people, another question, will people who have Medicare be required to get the insurance? Um, the answer is no. In fact, they're not eligible. As I believe I mentioned, um, if people are enrolled in Medicaid or Medicare, they're not even eligible to get this coverage at all. So um, the answer is no. Um, question, what do you mean employers will have to fill out forms? Do the individuals take those forms to their employers? Now that deals with the question on the application. One of the first questions is, do you have access to affordable health insurance from your employer? And um, those questions need to be answered. Um, and the businesses will very quickly start getting these forms to fill out from their employees. So it's going to become a standard thing, I hope, for, for businesses to provide this information to their employees so that they can accurately fill out the um, application. And, and yes, um, the employee will have a form to take to the employer just to get the information about the cost of the employee only plan and the actuarial value of that plan. And the employee might ask, well, how's the employer going to know what the actuarial value of the plan is? Well, they'll be talking to their insurance <laughs> representatives to figure that out. A question, are large employers considered 50 or more employees? And it's the technical way to look at it is 50 or more full-time equivalent employees. So basically, two part-time employees can equal one full-time equivalent employee. So that's part of the complications that um, resulted in the decision to delay the large employer reporting and penalties until 2015. Uh, you have to figure out your full-time equivalent. You know, there are issues about, you know, seasonal workers and um, part-time workers, and so that one calculation can, can be somewhat complex, so things are delayed for one year on that. Um, question, could you tell me if all the Virginia Community Health Centers will serve as navigators uh, in addition to the two organizations announced today? Um, the Community Health Centers, uh, 22 of our Virginia Community Health Centers are going to serve as certified application counselors. Uh, they will be certified by the federal government. They will be um, publicized as available to assist people. They are technically not navigators, so they technically have some fewer responsibilities than navigators have. Question, how does someone keep track of out-of-pocket expenses? Is it up to an individual or the insurance company? Um, the insurance company is going to keep track of those out-of-pocket expenses because remember, the out-of-pocket expenses that are counted towards that cap are only the cost of the essential health benefit. And the insurance company knows when everybody gets every benefit, every service, and knows when, when um, the co-payments are paid. So the insurance company will be responsible for um, letting the enrollee know when they've hit their cap. And at that point, the insurance company, rather than requiring co-pays, will just start paying the whole amount of the cost of the service. Here's a long question. If an employer currently offers affordable job-based insurance, but the employee elects not to participate, what prevents the employee from entering the marketplace prior to the required 2015 rules? In other words, will the employee be penalized, employer be penalized prior to 2015 if an employee goes to the marketplace? And, and the answer is they delayed the whole penalty, the reporting and penalty requirements for those large businesses until 2015. So in 2014, um, someone who works for a large employer, if for some reason they don't like what's being offered to them, they can go to the exchange. But remember, the first question is going to be, do you have access to affordable insurance 
from your employer. So that is an example of someone who is going to have to fill out the form to, to, um, to describe what is being offered by the um, employer and have that cost of employee only coverage compared to their family income. But the, with the employer, um, I mean, if it turns out that the um, insurance is not affordable for that employee, then yeah, they can go to the exchange. Um, and there won't be a penalty in 2014, but if that same scenario re repeats itself in 2015, then there will be a penalty for large employers to pay. Here's an important question. What happens to people under 100% of the poverty line who do not currently qualify for Medicaid? Well, this is a real problem for us in Virginia. Uh, remember I said that to get tax credits through the exchange, you have to have income between 100 and 400% of the poverty line. Our current Medicaid program has eligibility levels that for adults is much, 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 much less than 100% of poverty. In fact, there's no coverage at all for childless adults, even if they have zero income. That's what the Medicaid expansion is supposed to be for. The Medicaid expansion is supposed to fill in the gap between current Medicaid and actually 138% of the poverty line. But right now, we don't have a Medicaid expansion adopted in Virginia, and we most likely will not have a Medicaid expansion on January 1 of 2014. So that means that people with income below 100% of the poverty line are going to fall into what I call the Medicaid gap. And it's going to be a real problem, not just for the individuals who are going to find out that they don't have insurance, they don't have a way to get insurance, um, but it's going to be a real problem for all of us who are doing application assistance and departments of social services, and we're going to be, we're going to have to tell a lot of folks, up to 400,000 people in Virginia, that they don't qualify for any health insurance because Virginia has failed at this point to adopt the Medicaid expansion. Um, we certainly hope that that's going to change in the future, and I think that the um, examples will be finding. Uh, the people we'll be finding after October 1 who fall into the Medicaid gap will, will be important to explain those stories to our uh, lawmakers. Uh, a question about that uh, plan, that those plans that we're serving, um, Fairfax, and the, and the question is, is it Fairfax County, Fairfax City, or Fairfax area? I, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know exactly where the lines are drawn, but there is a Fairfax region, which is one of the geographic regions um, that allow for different um, rates for the health insurance policies. And so somebody knows exactly where those lines are drawn. I think it's a, a broader region than just the county or the city. Um, question, will we get phone numbers and places to send people if they need help? Well, absolutely. Um, give us time to get, get our show on the road. <laughs> In the meantime, if you can send people to the federal website, healthcare.gov, and to the federal call center, where there's lots and lots of information. But um, before October 1, we'll be able to tell folks other numbers um, of other people to um, contact for assistance. Um, several people have asked whether or not our presentation is going to be available. We're going to post the presentation and a recorded version of this webinar on the vplc.org uh, website by next week. So you'll be able to find it there. Um, and we will keep track of all the folks who participated today um, to make sure you have information about signing up for the next two webinars. Here's a question about the shop. How does a small business join the shop? Well, the small business also goes to the healthcare.gov website, and there's a separate application form for small businesses. And as you saw, there will be different plans offered to those small businesses. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a 
the same place, but a somewhat different process once you go there to apply for coverage for your small business employees. Uh, a question, are the penalties monthly? Um, the penalties that I noted before in the slide presentation, um, they are actually an annual penalty. So there again, you can see that it's, it's really not that much. This is the amount of the penalty that would um, come out of your taxes. It will either add to taxes you owe or come out of the refunds that you are expecting. A question about um, tax credit and whether or not if you get a, a lump sum tax credit at the end of the year or I guess during the year, will that be an asset for bankruptcy trustees? Um, I'm not a bankruptcy expert, but um, I assume this will be treated just the same way any other tax credit would be treated. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, here's a question about navigator services uh, from a, a local department of social services. Um, it said, uh, our agency, a local department of social services, anticipates receiving requests for navigator services. Our current workload doesn't allow us to provide that type of assistance. So how can we connect with the navigation services? Well, actually, the local departments of social services are going to have to process applications. Um, that, that's part of the law. The streamlined application that's used for both Medicaid, famous, and premium tax credits, it's all on one form. And because of the no wrong door policy, whether or not people apply online or in person or at DSS, um, those applications have to be processed. Uh, navigators don't make decisions about eligibility. We will just help people file applications. But DSS is going to have a very different role to play. They're going to have to determine eligibility, um, at least for Medicaid and FAMIS, and in a some kind of process that's invisible to the applicant. If, if the family doesn't qualify for Medicaid or FAMIS to get that application up to the federal marketplace to determine the um, person's eligibility for tax credit. Likewise, the, the federal marketplace taking applications is going to do an assessment of whether or not the person looks eligible for Medicaid. And if so, they're going to pass the application invisibly to the consumer back to local departments of social services to complete the processing of a Medicaid application. So there's going to be a lot of behind the scenes shifting of applications. But DSS um, uh, is, is in a position to actually process and make eligibility determinations. I do hope that navigators and other application counselors will work with local DSS offices in terms of providing information to the public and holding community meetings and uh, you know just being in touch so that they know the best way to help um, the folks who are seeking assistance. The next question, um, are the possible premiums for the most popular plans monthly or annual? Um, those, those ranges of rates that were on my slide are monthly rates. Uh, here's a question about veterans. If the individual is a veteran and receives health care through the VA system, must he have quip insurance? My understanding is that veterans, while eligible for veterans health services, don't really have health insurance. Um, and in that case, without insurance, the veterans can certainly apply for coverage through the exchange or through Medicaid and FAMIS for their kids. Um, and we know there are a lot of uninsured veterans in Virginia and who could take advantage of these new opportunities. Here's another question. If an applicant is denied for the marketplace because the family income is below 100% of the poverty line, would they receive a written notice or printout to prove this denial? Um, again, that would be someone who would fall into the Medicaid gap. And well, regardless, whatever the marketplace determines as far as the person's eligible,
eligibility for tax credits or not eligible for tax credits, or it looks like you should be eligible for Medicaid, there will be a notice issued to the applicant. Now, if people apply online, I expect that that notice is also going to be sent to them online. People will actually have an account where they use email addresses for getting information. If you apply with a paper application, I think in that situation you would be getting a letter in the mail uh, with the decision about your eligibility. But everyone's entitled to notices so they know what is going on with their application. Here, a final question is, what happens if a person misses open enrollment and doesn't meet the special enrollment requirements? Well, if you miss open enrollment and there's no grounds for special enrollment, I believe you just have to wait till the next year. I mean, you could file your application and uh, um, get the process started, but your health coverage wouldn't begin until January of the following year. Um, again, the special enrollment and the open enrollment don't apply to folks who are eligible for Medicaid or famous, but if the only thing you're eligible for are tax credits and you miss the deadline, um, you're, you're out of luck for that year. Um, and while I'm saying this, I'm thinking about um, the fact that you know, pregnancy is not considered a ground for, for special enrollment. So if someone misses the deadline and, and then they get pregnant, um, they may remain uninsured unless they qualify for a, a program that Virginia offers for pregnant women, they would remain uninsured until the very next year. So um, it really is important that people take advantage of open enrollment. It's a six-month period. I don't, think, I don't think everyone should apply on October 1 because that day is likely to be a little chaotic. Um, and as with every new system, um, everything's not going to be perfect. Um, so I, but I would encourage people, you know, a week, a weekend <laughs> to go ahead and start getting applications in. And, and certainly don't wait uh, until too long and don't miss the March 31st deadline. So with that, um, again, I, I want to wrap up. But thank you for participating today. Um, and I hope you'll join us again for the next uh, webinars. And we'll be sending information out to you by email to remind you about that and allow you to register for those events. So have a good day. Thanks.